uh, dear to my heart. And uh, many of you don't know, but we have one of the uh, famous accelerator physicists from our community who is the founder of uh, NSBP and sitting right there in the back. Sekazi, if you want to stand up. So Sekazi Mtingwa, who developed a theory uh, called intra-beam scattering that is being used by every single accelerator in the world. Um, and as a matter of fact, he has a fellowship under his name for those of you interested to attend the US Particle Accelerator School, which provides you with uh, uh, training opportunities. So we have three fantastic uh, speakers. You're going to learn about electron accelerators, about rare isotope accelerators, and application of accelerators in medicine. And I'm going to leave the podium to the MC. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Elena Echeverria. I'm a postdoc at um, Center for Bright Beams at Cornell University. And today I'm going to moderate this section. So our first speaker is um, Richie Patterson. Um, she is the Helen T. Edwards Professor of Physics at Cornell University, where she does research in the field of elementary particle phys physics using the Large Hadron Collider and directs the, the Center for Bright Beams, which is the center where I work, which is an um, NSF science and technology center whose goal is to increase the capabilities of electron beams. Um, Richie obtained her PhD at the University of Chicago, did a postdoc at Cornell University, and joined the Cornell faculty in 1994. She was an NSF National Young Investigator and a Sloan Foundation, Foundation Fellow, and is a Fellow of the American Physics Society, elected in 2003. She won Cornell, Cornell's Provost Award for Distinguished Scholarship and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, elected in uh, 2019. She served as co-chair of the physics department, directed the Cornell Laboratory for Accelerator-Based Science and Education class, and has served on numerous panels and communities, including the current National Academies panel. EPP 2024, which assessing the process and promise of elementary particle physics. So welcome, Rich. Thank you so much, Elena. And thank you all of you. It's just an incredible honor to be here at this conference, which has been just a wonderful experience. So let me tell you something about bright electron beams for science and society. Uh, first, I'll start with what is a particle accelerator? And you may know that accelerators accelerate electrons, protons, or ions to nearly the light speed of light for all sorts of purposes. And here's a sort of collage of some examples. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, you see the Large Hadron Collider, which is 17 miles around. And then the one right next to it on the bottom in the middle is an electron microscope, which is also a particle accelerator, except it fits on a table. And then there are some other examples in between uh, in the rest. So you could ask, why do we need these things? And the answer is they're used for all sorts of purposes. Uh, they're used in industry for food and product safety, like to sterilize Band-Aids and hamburger meat. They're used to detect contraband at our borders, and you can see that amazing x-ray of a truck. Uh, they're used in manufacturing for cross-linking polymers, and examples are the manufacture of tires and heat shrink tubing. Uh, and they're used also in semiconductor fabrication uh, for metrology and also ion implantation. They're used in medicine to produce isotopes and treat tumors. And later this, in this session, we'll hear a talk all about that. In all, there are about 40,000 medical and industrial accelerators in use, and that number is growing rapidly. Now, for all of us in this room, we are probably think mostly about research accelerators. I already mentioned electron microscopes. And then there are the very large scale accelerators like X-ray sources and the colliders for nuclear and particle physics. They've been hugely important. 
About one in three Nobel Prizes in both physics and chemistry owes something to a particle accelerator for that success. So as I look forward, what do I imagine for accelerators of the future? So I imagine bright beams that reveal not only the structure of biological molecules, but also their function. So that image down in the lower right is of the rhodopsin uh, protein. It's found in your eyes and it reconfigures when light reaches your eye. We would like to see that reconfiguration happen. That requires very short pulses of electrons to do. But if you look at state-of-the-art short electron pulses today, you get the photograph, the image on the left there, namely nothing. You get a blob, no information. But with 100 times brighter beams, you would get the image on the right. Suddenly, the structure of that rhodopsin, rhodopsin molecule pops out, and you could watch it in motion. I imagine bright beams that tell us how the proton gets its spin. Right now at Brookhaven National Lab, they are constructing an electron ion collider that will peer deep inside the proton. I imagine bright beams that uh, enable a sustainable future. Uh, there are concepts where proton accelerators either drive nuclear power plants or maybe even more likely transmute the nuclear waste from very long-lived uh, actinides to, very sh to much, much shorter lived uh, byproducts, making the storage problem much milder. And there are pilot projects going on in Belgium, India, and China trying to develop that technology. I imagine bright beams that extend Moore's law. Right now, the, be the smallest chips have five nanometer features on them. Uh, but with uh, accelerator-based technology, it looks like you could push that even further, something that is otherwise out of reach. I imagine bright beams that bring coherent x-rays to university campuses. So the image on the left was made at LCLS, an x-ray free electron laser that's huge at Slack National Accelerator Lab. But you can imagine compact x-ray sources using technology that's on the horizon that might be able to do that kind of thing in university campuses, by bypassing the very long wait in line to use LCLS. I imagine bright beams that clean the environment. Uh, high power accelerators can clean water, sludge, and flue gases. They've been shown to break down forever plastics, one of the few technologies capable of doing that. But we need to make them cheaper and simpler to do that. So here's a collage, a graph um, that places some of the accelerators I've talked about. On the horizontal axis is the beam power from very low to very high. You see colliders at the high end. And then on the vertical axis is the compactness of the beam, uh, how precise they are. And that also spans a range of many orders of magnitude. So there are many different kinds of accelerator. They all have different needs. They all lie in different places on the plot, but all of them need to move up and to the right if they want to open new frontiers. So let's dive in just a little bit. Here's a cartoon of a particle accelerator. On the left-hand side is the source where you produce your beam. Uh, I'll talk mostly about electrons, though that I'll talk mostly about electrons. Uh, then you pass them through an accelerating device that gets them up to near the speed of light. Along the way, you might steer them in with magnets and also focus them. And then finally, they'll hit the target, whatever that may be. So what are we trying to do? Well, we'd like to make higher power. We'd like to make higher brightness. And we'd like to lower the cost. So just to be more specific about what I mean about the brightness, uh, in the lower left is a uh, sketch of an electron bunch. Each uh, little red arrow is the momentum vector of an individual electron in the bunch. And what we'd like to do is transform that into the bunch on the right. There are more electrons. They're better aligned. They're more densely packed. So that's really uh, one of the frontiers right there and what I mean by brightness. 
so maybe one more thing I'll add is um, the research, I'm about to tell you about some of the research to develop better particle accelerators. And a lot of that work goes on in national labs. Uh, Oak Ridge is one of them. Um, but then there are also maybe a dozen universities that do this research and, and very importantly train graduate students. Uh, so let's dive into the source where we produce an electron beam. Uh, the, most of the time that is done through the photoelectric effect. So you have a photocathode, which is a chunk of material, any material, and it's bathed in a large electric field that will accelerate the electrons. Then you shine a laser on it and out comes your bunch. So let's dive in. What makes a good bunch or a bad bunch right there? And so now we're looking at the bunch just as it comes off the photocathode. Again, every red arrow represents an electron. And you can see they're going a little bit every which way. And we can define something called V perp, uh, which is the component of an electron's velocity that's uh, in the wrong direction. It's off to the side instead of the direction of travel. And so then we can define the mean transverse energy, which is just 1 half mv perp squared average. And what we would like to do is minimize that. In fact, brightness, as I showed you before, turns out to be proportional to the strength of the applied electric field, uh, and, and then inversely proportional to this mean transverse energy, 1 half mv per squared. So that's the thing we'd like to maximize, be the brightness. So what causes mean transverse energy? Um, the first thing is that if you shine a, a laser at, you shine a laser at the photocathode, if the wavelength of the light is such that it has more energy um, than the energy it takes to excite a, an electron out of the material and into the vacuum, then some, that excess energy is going to go into kinetic energy. That's bad. So you want to tune the wavelength of your laser to exactly emit the electrons. Surface non-uniformities, those give you components of electric field that are in the sideways direction. That accelerates your electrons the wrong way, bad. So you need atomically smooth surfaces. If you shine a very intense laser at the photocathode, then a single electron can absorb two photons. Then it has lots of kinetic energy, that's bad. So you need high quantum efficiency, high probability that an electron gets emitted for each photon, and that pushes you into using a semiconductor photocathode. So before I told you you could put up any material, you can, but a semiconductor is best. And then there are other things. There's many body scattering uh, that can uh, upset the electron on the way. And finally, you can actually engineer the band structure to give low transverse momentum inside the material. So people are working on all of these things. And it's been a bit of uh, a journey. For example, we knew about four of these five in a research group I'm in and we thought we had invented the perfect material. We, we produced it, we measured it, and it stank. And the reason was we, we didn't know about the many body scattering. So it's a work in progress. Um, here is a temperature scale. Uh, with, on the vertical axis is 1 half mv perp squared, the thing we're trying to minimize. Most particle accelerators in use today use something that's up at the top in the red zone. Using what I just showed you, in 2020, uh, a new record was set for the lowest um, transverse energy ever using a cold copper cathode. It's a, that was 5 milli-electron volts. The only challenge there is you had to use such a low intensity laser that you got almost no electrons out. But the electrons that did come out were beautiful. So how can you do better? Like I said, it's a semiconductor photocathode. And here in 2022, uh, for the first time, a photocathode was grown that was um, a single crystal. And that means it was atomically flat across its surface, which is another goal. 
So this is some of the progress that's been happening. There's much more to do. We need to make them tough because particle accelerators are messy places. We need to produce lots of current. And for some applications, we need to produce spin polarized electrons. So this is an ongoing project, but maybe what you can see is that it combines not just the expertise in accelerators, but also expertise in materials and surface chemistry, things like that. So everybody can help. Here's the impact of a good photocathode. Why did I spend so long talking about it? Um, here, this is ultra-fast electron diffraction. So what we do is we take an electron beam and we're going to scatter it off a twisted bilayer. So on the right, we have a, there's a single, two single hexagonal layers and you twist them, you get this moiré pattern. And if you look at the diffraction pattern inside the big racetrack oval on the left, you can see two very bright spots. One of those comes from each of the hexagon layers. And then you see two faint spots, and it turns out that those come from the very large-scale hexagon pattern. That's the first time that's ever been seen, and the reason it was possible to see it this time was because the beam was coherent across that wide area. And that transverse coherence is the result of a very bright electron bunch using a superb photocathode. And uh, so, there are some details. Another implication. Uh, this is a photograph of LCLS at SLAC. What that is is a free electron laser. Um, you accelerate electron beam to uh, near light speed, and then you wiggle it so that they produce x-rays. This is the world's most intense x-ray source. I use for all sorts of biology and chemistry and so on. On the right-hand side, you can see a graph that displays its performance. On the horizontal axis is the photon energy going out to 14 keV, and on the vertical axis is the flux. LCLS2, shown in red, actually is a, an upgrade of LCLS that just turned on in the last month or so, and you can see its performance. But they have already started on the next upgrade, LCLS2 high energy, which will have the performance shown in blue. And you can see that it's much, much better at the high end. If you put a world-class photocathode in there, uh, that would increase the photon for X-ray flux at the high end by a factor of 10. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about accelerating beams. Um, that's the red gizmo in the middle here. Uh, there's a very uh, innovative technology in development, plasma wakefield acceleration. You have a plasma, you send some sort of disruptor through either a laser pulse or a charged particle pulse. That creates a wakefield of ions and electrons that produces a very strong electric field. That's what you need to accelerate beams. And so if you put an electron bunch right there, you can get huge accelerations over very short distances. This is an important area of research. Um, it ha still has a ways to go before it's usable, but it's promising. I'll talk a little bit more about the technology that is in use today. Um, this is uh, an, a, a, an oscillating cavity. What you can see in the, in the animation is oscillate. This is a, a device like Yay Big. It's hollow. Inside, there are oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And what happens is a bunch comes in and it's timed so that it actually surfs the electric field, which are the blue arrows, and picks up speed. For small accelerators, these devices are made out of copper, and so that's great for many of the applications I've told you about. For very large-scale accelerators, uh, they're made out of niobium, um, cooled to 2 kel Kelvin, where they're superconductors. And the reason for that is that they then have nano-ohm resistance. And so very, they dissipate much less heat uh, than a copper cavity would do. So there are lots of 
research on developing these devices. You'd like to be able to operate them at higher temperature. You'd also like to use a, semi, a superconductor that has a higher critical magnetic field because the magnetic field and the electric field are proportional. So if you have a high, can tolerate a higher magnetic field, you also get higher acceleration. You would think with all these high TC superconductors and everything that that would be a slam dunk. It's not. It's hard to find one that you can machine and fabricate into these kinds of devices. And so niobium-310 and niobium zirconium are, are what people are looking at. And I'll just show you very quickly recent progress. Uh, you, what you do is you coat the niobium-310 on top of the niobium. The fields don't penetrate very deep, so it can be a rather thin layer. Um, but then when you look at those surfaces, or at least when we looked at them a couple of years ago, what we would do is find spots where there was a, a too low a tin contribution. And so we learned to fix that. And the upshot is that we can now operate niobium-310 at 4K rather than 2K with niobium. It sounds tiny, but it's huge. Because at 4K, 2K, you need a million dollar refrigeration system shown on the left. At 4K, you can use a $50,000 cryocooler, and it's way simpler. And so there are now, yeah, and so a number of national labs are now working on this. So what's this? These are awful. These are roundworms. They are found in human intestines, about 22% of people worldwide, about 2% of the US population. And they're hard to get rid of. They come out in feces, they enter our sewage system. Here is a sewage system, and I won't go through much of it, but the purple block there is the output, it's compost, and unfortunately it still has parasite eggs in it. If you shine it with an electron beam, you kill the vast majority of those, as well as other things, and also break down the forever plastics. So there are now pilot plants to do this under construction in Poland and China. Jefferson Lab is also working with a local sewage company to try it out here in the United States. Another uh, application, lithography. So today's EUV tools, which make the finest uh, uh, semiconductor chips in the latest technology, um, are big. Here's a picture of one, and they're going into widespread use. They tend to be very hugely power consuming, uh, but, and also they're not extendable. You can't make even smaller things, but that you can with particle accelerator technology like that used in LCLS that I showed you. And there are two companies doing that. So I'm gonna stop. Some of the work that I've shown you was done in a center called the Center for Bright Beams that I direct. We have a number of graduates from Clark Atlanta University that we're very proud of. Some of the people in this room are partners with us. And so I invite you to get involved. Particle accelerators are, accelerator scientists are in enormous demand. So consider graduate school uh, in accelerator science. There are RU programs, SULI programs, um, if you're interested, talk to me. I'm happy to tell you more. And as one last advertisement, uh, we introduced Sakazi Matingwa earlier, and he, there is a scholarship in his name at the US Particle Accelerator School. And I invite you to take one of their courses. So thank you. Thank you, Richie, for that cool and bright talk. Uh, I think we have time, we don't have time, sorry, for questions, but we will have time at the end for more questions. Okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Julian Polar Larkin. Uh, she's... Uh, okay, sorry. Let's switch the order. <laughs> our next speaker is Tomar Gas. Gasmerker, leads, um, he leads the world unique facility for rare isotopes beams, um, FRIP laboratory, um, a US Department of Energy Office of Science, scientific user facility owned and operated by Michigan State University. FRIP supports the mission of the DO 
ESC, Office of Nuclear Physics, and a community of 1,800 scientists uh, worldwide, hosting what is designed to be the most powerful heavy ion accelerator. FRIP enables uh, scientists to make discoveries with rare, um, rare, rare, sorry, rare isotopes about how the universe forms, while advancing innovation in medicine, nuclear security, environment, science, and more. In the air of a research university, FRIP also trains the next generation scientific workforce as part of the um, MSU's Nuclear Physics Graduate Program, which is a nationally top rank according to the US News and World Report. Within MSU, FRIP is equivalent to a college. As a laboratory director since 2015, Thomas oversees FRIP's research and education missions, the advancement of core capabilities and technical innovation that advance discovery and the state of the art. Thomas sets the laboratory's vision and prior, pri priorities, directs supporting policies and programs, secures optimal operations and project funding, and ensures that the FRIP laboratory satisfies contractual commitments and operates in a safe, cost-efficient, and environmental responsible manner. Thomas earned um, his master in 1990 and PhD in 1992, degrees in physics from Florida State University. He joined the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, NS NSCL, at MSU in 1992 as an NSCL fellow. In 1995, he joined the MSU faculty in the Depar Department of Physics and Astronomy and is an MSU University Distinguished Professor since 2009. His research resulted in more than 2,000 publications and was recognized in 2006 with the Stacker Prize in the Physical Science. He is a fellow of the American Physics Society, a fellow of the American Association Association for the Advancement of Science and is, an, is a Stanford Certificate Project Manager. In 2008, Thomas led uh, the team that prepared the winning FRIP proposal and served as a FRIP project director for the 13 project that was completed on budget and ahead of a schedule in January 2022. And Thomas serves as an advisory and review committees for one of a kind science project and facilities around the world. So thank you and wait. <laughs> it's a really long, you have done a lot. <laughs> so, thank so thank you so much, Paul. There is an abbreviated version too, just has two lines. <laughs> so Professor Ritchie gave a nice introduction to accelerators. And I'll tell you the story how we built one of those. And this accelerator accelerates heavy ions, and it really, really takes a lot of energy to bring them to, half, to, to, to the full speed of light. So we're only going to bring them to half the speed of light. And so um, the facility for our isotope beams is a DOE Office of Science user facility. It's not a DOE national lab, because Congress decided not to make any more national labs. And um, we offer scientists discovery opportunities with rare isotopes. Those are isotopes that, that no longer naturally exist on Earth. They were made in the stars and have long since decayed, but we can make them for a split second. And we built this facility in the last roughly 10 years with a team of 500 people. And I have no particular knowledge about accelerators, but I figured out some time in my career that I can get people, I guess you would say, to be coherent or to align, just like those um, momentum vectors or velocity vectors. You know, if we all do um, work on something together and we take care of each other, we can do great things, things that nobody could do by themselves. And that's part of the story here. So EFRIP was built to be the most powerful heavy ion accelerator, not the most energetic, the most power. We're running at 10 kilowatts now. We started at 1 kilowatt a good year ago. Now we're at 10. Next year we go to 20. And when we're at 20 kilowatts, we're more powerful than um, our Japanese colleagues. And eventually we go to 400 kilowatts because but there is no blueprint. You can't just turn it on at 400 kilowatts because probably something would melt or break or not be good. So we need to slowly go up in power um, 
a step at a time and we're having big debates what the good size of a step would be. Okay. So we delivered this $730 million project on budget ahead of schedule in spite of COVID. And that caught the attention of DOE. And um, then they studied at this, as, as this year in the Project Leadership Institute and they had their concluding celebration this week in DC. So it's like a psychoanalysis of a project. So you have six teams that tell you stuff about you. You didn't, you kind of knew, but didn't want to hear, or maybe we do want to hear it. Because the trick is, it's all about the people. So the key to EFRIP was we needed to build a team where all could do their best work and accomplish what nobody can do alone. And we had to bring people from all over the world to mid Michigan because we, 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 we even though we were the chosen size, the site, we didn't have those kind of people. So we have to hire people from Japan and we need to find places where they can buy the fish they like and so on. And we hire people from the East Coast um, and from California and um, from, from all over the world. And so then I was thinking, how do we get them work together? And the person who started us out, Henry Blosser, joined MSU from Oak Ridge, and we um, had a get together with all the people um, who worked with him. And he, he must have been a genius. I knew him when he was retired. He was clearly smart. But it was a thing built around Henry Blosser. And EFRIP is too big to be built around one person. And so we had to make this system where type A hard charging personalities all subordinate themselves under the common good and build effort. And it, um, that's the way to go because the, to keep the lab at the cutting edge, we had to deliver a big project, but big projects takes many people and the problems are harder. So we had to create some sort of climate where everybody could feel valued and be their best. And this is gonna be in the end, the same what we're now trying to do on broadening participation. But we learned it from the positive interdependence that building an accelerator needs. All the people have to work together or the darn thing doesn't work. A key feature of an accelerator is that the default is it doesn't work. And only when everything is right, does it work. And so we've been doing this since 1965 and now um, have this effort thing done for the next 20, 30 years. So since we didn't know, didn't know very much, we had to learn some of the things Professor Patterson described. So we had to learn superconducting our technology. That's the niobium bit, and we're running it mainly at two Kelvin, but a little bit at four Kelvin. And so we invited people and we went places and humbly asked for their time and um, people were generous with their time and they taught us. And then we um, found some people in Indiana who can help us make these cavities rather than buying them from Europe. We taught folks, um, we made prototypes, taught folks how to, to make them, set up a quality system, and we hired local people to work in our clean rooms. And all of those were hired away when a Silicon Valley chip maker set up shop in Ann Arbor, they doubled their salaries. But we're universities, so we're gonna teach more. So we hired more undergraduates to teach them how to make these cavities. And it was a little bit hard because we had to learn from our mistakes, but in the end, we were able to build one of these cryo modules, these, oops, these green things are like big thermos cans, you know, they're 280 Kelvin, which is our temperature, and inside it's two Kelvin, so they're like a big thermos bottle, and we built 46 of them, one every three weeks. And this rate of production was similar that, to that, that what the French did when they helped build a German electron accelerator. So each one of these is $3 million, you know, 50 people work together, but they all work like in a ballet, nicely choreographed, and they're most of them like each other. I mean, it was very nice. It was calm, no excitement. The drama all had gone away. So we also had to learn how to build a helium liquefaction plant because we thought we would buy one from the Swiss, but it was $70 million and we only had 35. And 
when you buy from somebody who has a monopoly, because the French company, which is now in the US market, had closed down shop for fear of some litigation, which we never understood. So we decided we better learn it ourselves because we don't have the money. And we broke it into eight pieces and bought um, pieces from different vendors and we took on the risk of system integration. And so in the end, we built this cryo plant, but because we were doing it ourselves, we also wanted to make it very energy efficient because the biggest um, electricity consumption goes into making this helium to cool the superconductor to accelerate the beam. In some sense, we're very inefficient. It takes us to make 400 kilowatts of beam, we need about 10 megawatts of power. So saving energy was important. And the trick to this cryo plant is that it runs in, it has a fancy name, floating pressure process cycle, but all it is until then in cryo plants, the cycle is well defined and you have heaters when there is not enough load, you heat it up. This thing can float around and self adjust and when there is no heat, you just have less compression. So you don't force it into a predictable cycle, but you let it self adjust. And the nice thing now is when the load of the accelerator goes down because you run less field, the helium use goes down, the, the, sorry, the, not the helium use, we recover the helium, but the heat load goes down and then we use less power to liquefy the helium. And that saved us about 30% of the energy, and so it turns out we put in power lines that, that are too big. But it's good, we don't have to pay for the electricity. Um, so then we decided this was a big, you know, it was a little scary when we had to learn how to build these cryo plants, so we don't want to be there again. We started the MSU Cryogenic Initiative with mechanical engineering. Mechanical and chemical engineering together is cryogenic engineering. You need to know about mechanical engineering, but also about chemical engineering. And now we're graduating PhDs in cryogenics and masters, and about two or three per year. And the Boeing recruiter, she wants to hire six. So we don't even have, and this is just Boeing. So that is a, another example of a niche career supporting accelerators, cryogenics, engineering. Also with the hydrogen economy coming, there is gonna be a lot of jobs because whether you liquefy hydrogen or helium, it's the same thing. The other thing that taught people is that welders are really important because helium atoms are so small, they go through weld leaks that are not seen with penetration dye tests. So we had to teach a bunch of welders how to do um, these uh, leak tight tests some of these welders from Mid Michigan did some welding for the people at LCLS2 um, that was mentioned earlier. So you have some little Michigan shop working for Stanford that made them very proud and part of the larger accelerator community. It also teaches the fancy physicists to respect the trades because without the trades, um, you can't do it. And it makes the trades really, really proud. Those are people um, that had never seen a university and you know they're working on really fancy stuff. And those are some of our most loyal employees and it's an example of good positive interdependence. Okay, it all came together. Then we went back to science. We started it up and under the leadership of Heather Crawford, who is at Berkeley Lab, um, the physicists of, from this whole group of universities, including University of Tennessee, Knoxville, um, did some measurement. The first paper um, came out of Berkeley. The second came out of UTK, out of Knoxville, about six months after we started the accelerator. In the end, we're doing all this for these 1,800 people who represent the user community. Um, we we self-identify as low energy nuclear physics. I don't know if the name is really good, but that's the low energy nuclear physics. I know it's not good. And I argue with them and they say, oh no, 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 it's fine. It's the low energy part. So anyways, <laughs> yeah, we need a different brand. I mean, it sounds kind of sleepy. It's not sleepy though, but okay. So 
the machine is in high demand. We have um, people from all over the world, North America, South America, Central America, Africa. You can see it here. We used to have uh, Russia, but then with the um, Ukraine invasion, that we can't work with the Russians anymore. Okay. In the last year or so, we made about 200 rare isotopes to 600 um, experimenters, and then next year, we're going to make more. So nuclear science research with rare isotopes has many applications. Some are shown here. If you're interested in societal betterment or advancement, which I think is important because we get paid by society, so we should give something back. And we also, because we make all kinds of isotopes not used for scientific research, we will, we are harvesting them and make them available starting next year for societal applications. This used to be part of the DOE nuclear physics program, and now it's the DOE isotope program because the two programs separated because isotopes became so big. The last thing, we're using that same accelerator to test chips. There is a shortage in the nation of a chip testing facilities because anything that flies or locomotes like in a self-driving car needs to be tested so that cosmic rays don't um, mess up the chip and then there would be an accident. So, so we figured out how to build this climate variable can work together, and that's the same premise of the belonging part in the IB. So with Paul joining um, about five years ago, we embarked on this um, program to help um, broaden participation in accelerator physics. And now we got this program that goes from high school to undergrad students, and then we try to place postdocs, or we are placing postdocs with NSF grants at um, MSI University. So then they do their research at EFRIP, they bring their students and so on. So that is the representation piece. At the same time, we need to work on the integration piece, the belonging piece, and we have a good gaggle of the lab who, who experienced this accelerator bit where people work together to do the same thing. Um, this is another slide, and I'm kind of out of time. So we have a, a multitude of programs here going from um, middle school, high school, and through graduate studentship and postdocship being placed into faculty positions. At the same time, we're trying to help out the government. This comes from the Office of Management and Budget in the White House. Um, not this one, this is, sorry, this is our graduate program. So we have a graduate program, I'll be done. But, sorry, I'll do this. So we, we have um, four areas in the nation, um, cryogenic engineering, RF engineering, um, systems engineering for accelerators. We teach all of those at MSU, and we just reached out to the, uh, to the engineering departments and we set up this just like other universities, um, graduate certificates, graduate programs in accelerator engineering. We also have nuclear chemistry. That's another shortage in the nation. And um, this is all put together in the EFRIP run um, nuclear science PhD program. But the degrees are in departments, physics, chemistry, engineering, computer science. So in the end, EFRIP is a good thing, a game changer for nuclear science in the world. It helps the nation, it helps the world, the nation, Michigan, MSU. We started in 2008, finished 14 years later um, for the money we had with 5 million left. And we enabled discoveries for a large group of scientists, 1800, and they bring their students and make their measurements. But to get there, we had to build a team with positive interdependence and, and work together. Now we're going to you know, let we learn about that a little bit. We're tweaking this approach to broaden participation in nuclear physics. So fellowships, all this stuff, if you're interested, um, you, you know, it's on the website and it's, it's that time of the year. The grad application banner is on the top right now. It can, kind of goes on vacation in the spring, but it always comes back in the fall. So thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for that great and isotopic presentation. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, you have a few minutes. Two minutes. Is there any question? Yeah, on the back. Uh, hi, I'm Alan. Uh, I go to Stony Brook University. I just had a question in terms of the um, shielding from cosmic rays for the chip. Can you go and elaborate a little bit on that? And um, also for FRIB, do you think that accelerators have more um, application to things like isotope production, or do you think colliders are more the future? Thanks. Okay, so what's the first part about shielding, radiation shielding? Um, I, you had mentioned in passing that there were cosmic rays that could mess up chip design. Oh, chips, yeah. So yeah, if you could yeah. talk about that. Okay, so then, you know, the cosmic rays hit the Earth and lighter particles are made and they fly along and they can knock crystal uh, uh, atoms out of their crystal in a transistor or something. And so when you have an IC, and I didn't know this until this came up, the Texas, so the vice president of Texas Instruments lives in Detroit, or is from Detroit, and we ended up talking. This is how that came about. So when the, when the, when the light particles hit the silicon or something, knocks that out, the chip stops working. So to make sure that doesn't happen on an airplane, so Texas Instrument now comes with a whole gaggle of chips. They're all slightly different and they test them. We're given them, you know, 50 years of cosmic rays in five minutes. And then they say, well, these are no good, these are good. And then they can take pencil beams and they run the chip and figure out what junction needs to be made thicker. And so, so that gets you to make thicker chips and more material, but less power gets you make it thinner, make it thinner. So when, as they make it thinner, they need to make them robust enough. That's the um, chip testing. To make isotopes, um, so colliders are really good for many things, but they don't have much current or much power. They have a lot of energy. So the trick to make rare isotopes is you got to start with something and break it into pieces. And the more you start with, the more pieces you make. So making, we're going to make in the end 10 to the 13 uraniums per second and break them up. There is not really, um, yeah, colliders, they, they, it's not good for them. You know, the colliders can give you central collisions or other things, but not up for isotope making. And so while we are funded for basic science, you know, I wonder in 20 years, maybe we're going to make great discoveries. I'm sure we will. But I also think some of these isotopes we're making will do some good for people. Oh, no. Thank you for that explanation. I just, I, to clarify my second yeah. question, um, I don't mean to say that colliders would be useful in that case. Oh. I just mean um, if you put one against the other, like let's say we're talking about the EIC versus FRIP. Oh, which you one, need which both. one do you think that? <laughs> which one do you think is something that is going to draw more in the future in the United States for physics? I think we honestly need both. So I'm a big supporter of the EIC. They're, they're different things. It's like you want to um, have a garden and you need a spade and you need a rake. If you only have one, it's hard. So, so, so it's, it's, we always say it's complementary, but this is really complementary. And, um, you know, also the technology, we can talk about that is different. And, you know, the, this thing is running now. The EIC hopefully will be running, I don't know, in 10, 15 years. But they're, they're both good. Okay, let's thank, thank Thomas again. Thank you. Okay, our last but not least uh, talk is about um, some applications in medicine. Dr. Julian. Paul Larkin is an associate professor of medical physics, physics at the University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. She is the service chief medical physicist in MD Anderson's thoracic, 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 thoracic. 
thoracic, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Radiation Oncology Clinic. Dr. Polar Larkin also conducts clinical research and mentors and teaches medical physics residents and graduate students. Her primary research interests include flash ultra high dose radiotherapy, pacemaker radiotherapy, dose measurements, and improve, improving the efficacy, efficacy? No, sorry, efficacy of motion management in thoracic, thoracic treatments and radiobiology. Julian is also the chair of the American Association of Physicists in Medicines, AAPM, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. She received her PhD in biomedical physics at UCLA and her bachelor's in physics and mathematics at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. After receiving her PhD at UCLA, Julianne was accepted into the medical physics residency program at MB Anderson in Houston, Texas. Following her residence, Julianne was hired by MD Anderson as faculty as faculty. Beyond her role in the clinic and classroom, Julianne is a firm believer in outreach and increasing the pipeline of women in an under, underrepresented population in science, ensuring that more underrepresented students and women follow in her footsteps in Julia's passion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all, seriously. And now after that wonderful talk, Dr. Glassmacher, I have to understand that I am definitely not a low energy physicist. I want you all to be aware of that, but I am a pseudo particle physicist, right? I want you to understand I am definitely somebody who is an end user of the types of devices that they talked about for medical purposes. Because I'm not as nice as Dr. Richie Patterson. No, ma'am, I am not as nice as you. I'm not just trying to kill king, little, what are the round worms in the sewage? No. I use my Linux to kill every single day. Every day I'm lethal, but it's for tumors, all right? Because we're about making cancer history. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you for your service because it is Veterans Day. So for those of you that it does apply to, please go ahead and take your bow and your curtsy. Otherwise, I want to first acknowledge all the wonderful people who helped to put this whole entire event together and for allowing me to have the stage that I have right now. Dr. Paul Gay, most informed, of course, first, then as well as Dr. Carol Scarlett, everyone, Aunt Jessie over there on the right hand side in the green, yes, and everybody who helped put this together. Thank you, organizers. What I want to talk to you today about is how we use these linear accelerators, these particle accelerators, every single day to treat the populations all across the world. I'm not just talking about American patients, anyone. Do you guys understand the cancer statistic that one out of two of us in our lifetime will be diagnosed with cancer if you're good enough to have health care insurance? Everybody understand that? So yes, if you've got insurance, raise up. That means you too can get diagnosed and treated by me. So what we're gonna talk about is pretty much the history of medical physics and radiation therapy. Please fill in, find a seat, get close. It's gonna get warm. Next, we're gonna talk about what's going on clinically right now. All these wonderful devices that we just discussed for about the last 40 minutes. I wanna tell you about how we use clinical medical physics linear accelerators that we use every single day. And then the piece of the puzzle that makes it even more exciting, not just the power coming from the LINAC that actually treats the tumor, but being able to visualize both the normal tissue as well as where the tumor is, the adding the imaging guidance component onto the modern day linear accelerators. That's that new part that makes our current era fabulous when it comes to cancer care. I want you to understand that I have no conflicts of interest. If you happen to support a company or so forth and want to pay me to talk about your device, please meet me on the outside. But so far, I have no conflicts of interest. So let's go through some MedFiz history. So everything started, I think most people are aware of Rankin's wonderful, beautiful radiograph of his wife's hand. Everybody's familiar with that in 1895. But ladies, where are you? Stand up, raise a hand, cat call. What I want you to understand, within three years, that's right, lady physicist, you better stand Stand up. We happen to have within three years of radiation actually being discovered, guess what? We had a double Nobel Prize winner actually help us identify some of those isotopes. Not so rare, but discovered with her husband, yes, with her man, can you believe that? In 1898. And we were able to actually utilize it not just for purposes that are, of course, for a mass destruction or so forth, but actually for medical purposes very early on. And still to this day, this particular notable fact about her having two different different Nobel Prizes in two different categories still has not been met or challenged. So from 1890s, the late 1890s, when we discovered radiation therapy, we were in the heyday of the era. Everybody was excited. 
Everybody wanted to understand exactly how do we utilize them. In fact, they thought it was fanciful, so fanciful that we utilize radiation for all kinds of things that we shouldn't have. It was everything for the wrong purpose. It's not all for the good. If you had a headache, guess what you'd do, Dr. Patterson? Go ahead and x-ray it. If you had some extra hair on your chin, guess what would you do? X-ray it. I want you to understand, within a year of that, guess what? We already had a nature paper, but for bad reason, because people were over utilizing using these radiographs. The handlers of these devices actually started to have horrible effects and damaging effects on their person because of the way that they are actually utilizing it. So it wasn't shocking that we started to think about how can we start delivering radiation therapy better? How can we move this such that we aren't just worrying about the power of the beam, how fast the beam is going, how penetrating it is, but how can we narrow it, focus it, and make it only deliver to the areas of interest? so we can make use of it for a clinical medical reason to help advance humanity as opposed to actually creating the cancer that we're trying to treat. So look, if you happen to be a Canadian, rise up. Thank you Canadians, because 1951, you guys came up with an idea. If I first actually put an imaging component on the same line of sight as a LINAC, guess what I can do? I can see the patient in real time in the same orientation that they'll be for beam treatment and delivery, as well as know beforehand exactly where the normal tissue is and where the tumor is at the same time. And then everybody, if you can body roll, go ahead and arch your back, because then, they realize if I can do this at the time of treatment, I can spare and give better a care for these patients and actually result in having lower damaging effects as well as lower toxicity to our patients. That was 1951. And if you know anything about linear accelerator history, then you know that was right at the very cusp of everything coming together because it wasn't until what, 1956 or so, you started to see Stanford having that first LINAC. What do those LINACs look like back then? Horrible. Gargantuan. Nobody in this room, I think, is older. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Let me know. Raise your hand if you raise whatever you can if you were back in this day and saw it like that. But I want you to understand, it was massive. And here's an image of what it looks like when they treated the, and successfully treated this first pediatric patient who actually had a lesion that was treating their brain, would have utilizing that first lack in 1956. And what's funny and almost eerie is that, oh my gosh, Dr. Glasswalker, do you see it? It looks almost the same size and scale and scope of what they had back from the 1950s. I want you to understand, some things don't change in even the orientation of the gantries that we utilize to treat patients. So why do we use proton particle accelerators within radiation therapy? Why? Because they work, boo. That's why. It maximizes disease control, improves overall survival, minimizes both early and late effects, as well as preserves organ function and preserves quality of life. And after all, it helps to eliminate unnecessary radiation to the patient based upon the wonderful dynamics of how that beam actually gets delivered, where once you get past the Bragg peak, all the dose fall off happens right there, and no more dose goes beyond the area of interest. That's what makes particles, um, proton beams, so uniquely fabulous for radiotherapy. But also then, too, because of the size and scale of actually utilizing these wonderful devices, also much more expensive. But when you can, please see if, you're, um, see if you can get proton therapy. And what I love is what Dr. Suit said. One cannot have a radiation-induced side effect and tissue that does not receive um, does not see, receive radiation. That's the whole spin of why we use protons. And also, what you'll realize, whenever protons does give dose, we have actually dramatically reduced how much normal tissue dose is delivered for giving proton therapy. We started back in the 1980s, just like myself. When I was born, that's when we started utilizing 3D chromoformal radiotherapy for utilizing X-rays. And in the 90s, we started intensity modulating them. That's called the IMRT era. Then in the 2000s, we moved to what's called VMAT, delivering in an arc and one failed swoop, giving all that radiation dose. Then we started having some proton passive radiotherapy that was delivered in 2005 to now the current air and intensity modulated proton therapy. So now we are conforming the beam for even protons uniquely to the shape of disease and sparing all normal tissue nearby. So right now, I know nobody's gonna high five me on it, but this is the time to get diagnosed and actually treated for cancer. We have tools that were never at our disposal before. These accelerators are the basis for how we are taking care of the patients. And how many cancer patients do you think actually get treated with a LINAC of some sort, whether it happens to be x-ray or protons? 70% and growing. 
So please understand, it is the most quiet, under-talked-about secret of cancer therapy, Linax. If you happen to be a particle physicist, pat yourself on the back. You're helping making this possible every day. So I want you to understand, let's go through some actual history of medical linear accelerators. Back in 1928, this is on nobody's slide that I've seen so far, Witterow demonstrated that electrons could be accelerated through a tube by applying a radio frequency voltage to sections of that tube. And then all the way by 1949, the idea of utilizing this LINAC that he hypothesized, everyone became interested within the medical sphere. Medical LINACs then have been in clinical use since the early 1950s, as that picture from 1956 that I showed you earlier. And the first one was installed at Hammersmith in 1952. By 94, we already had a different kind of device. We're delivering again, almost in a CT scanner orientation. The cyber knife was created. Then 97, Stanford pioneers the use of intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is still heavily used to this very day, which the unique aspect of it is by intensity modulating the beam by utilizing these huge metal leaves to shape the beam in multiple dimensions so that that beam, that wonderful, powerful beam that we've been discussing for the last hour or so, it actually conforms just to the shape of where you want to treat and protects everything else nearby. What I want you to understand, there are a whole bunch of players. If you're interested in figuring out exactly where the money makers are in cancer research, hello. There, take a picture, figure out who to put some money in. If you like to buy stocks, there you go. I don't buy stocks in that because then I'd have to declare it. But I want you to understand, there are a number of different companies that are in this space and there are places obviously where you can work, especially as a research physicist. There are so many elements that you can utilize to find a job if you're interested. Just hit me up or talk directly to these companies. What I really want you to realize is that there's a different set of cancer types that these Linux can treat. There is no limit to the type of tumor that a linear accelerator can treat. We treat it all on a daily basis because they deliver both types of energy, whether it happens to be electron or photon based um, beams. What I want you to realize is that there's a market for every type of linear accelerator, and they come with so many different shapes, sizes, and different whistles with them. What I want you to understand if it comes down to the imaging capabilities of them, because as I already told you, if you can't see it, you can't treat it. You don't just turn a beam on a person and say, good luck. That is not the case in a clinic. So based upon which device you see up here, it has a unique image guidance radiation therapy technique associated with it. <clears throat> and so what I wanna help break down, and we have alluded to this before, there are some wonderful pictures from Dr. Patterson's talk earlier, how she opened us up so perfectly. There are several basic components of the linear accelerators that we happen to utilize in our centers. They're about 17,000 pounds, each of them. What I want you to understand, there are two major components, the actual gantry that turns and rotates around the patient, and then the patient couch, where the patient actually is actually placed on it and actually sat in position and in a reproducible way, utilizing immobilization devices to hold still underneath the gantry. What you'll see is that the very base, base is, um, the foundation of it, there's a waveguide, <coughs> excuse me, and a microwave amplifier that's gonna amplify the beam that, from the electron gun and shoot it down through the accelerator waveguide that will then hit um, the actual target that will either turn it into um, a photon beam or no target in a scattering foil, which will allow for an electron beam to still penetrate past and then be shaped by all the wonderful machinery that happens to be in the treatment head, which will include multi -leaf, multiple leaf, multi leaf collimators, as well as wedges and a whole plethora of different, um, and that, uh, different devices, all based to make sure that that beam is shaped uniquely to the shape of the target that you ultimately want to treat. So there are different types of systems um, in components that we utilize to get that beam. You have the power supply system, which is gonna include a modulator to provide high voltage and short duration pulses and synchronization. You're gonna have the electron injection system, which is gonna be that electron gun that I discussed, a microwave system, which will either be a magatron or a klystron, and then a beam transport beam, <clears throat> which is gonna be be that accelerating waveguide. After that, you'll have an auxiliary system, but most importantly, safety. When you are treating patients, the most important aspect of my job as a medical physicist is verifying the safety of the patient. Why? Because you're dealing with a deadly beam, that you're trying to always make sure the integrity of the system is such that it only impacts where you want and does not deliver dose outside of that. You have a computer controlled feedback system as well as beam collimators. <clears throat> this is what the beam <clears throat> power supply looks like current power to the modulator, which includes the pulse warming network and a switch tube known as that hydrogen thyrotron, high bulge pulses from the modulator section and flat top DC pulses. And this is what the components actually look like from an older system shown on the top and on the right hand side. 
<clears throat> the electrons are produced within the electron gun. They are boiled off of this hot cathode, sort of like what was mentioned before. And the gantry, the workhorse of the device that actually rotates and allows for you to deliver beam no matter what orientation the patient or the tumor it happens to be in. That's actually going to be able to rotate 360 degrees and has a lot of different testing that we have to provide in order to prove that it's not moving at too dangerous a rate because it's so heavy. You have no idea about the scale and the scope and the size of these things. It's pretty much about like seven and a half feet tall. Then the length of it's going to be probably on the order of about two meters when you come into the room. So this thing is sitting there pretty much imagine like two shacks sitting at um, <laughs> almost at a 90 degree orientation of one another. Yeah, actually, that's a good description. It looks like two shacks put together at an angle. And so, but don't tell shack. So this is what the microwave sources look like, and there's different characteristics about them. If it happens to utilize a magnetron, for the microwave source, that's going to be for low energy accelerators. They're less costly, they're smaller, and they're usually meant for older type systems. Nowadays, most modern systems have to use that klystron, which is going to give you stable, higher energies. That magnetron is going to produce high frequency microwaves and it functions as a high power oscillator. And so the frequency about each pulse is about 300,000 megahertz. And if you want to look at the peak power output, that's what it happens to be about two megawatts for these six MB or less Linux, which aren't as common today, but mostly what you'll see is about the five megawatt ones used for klystrons. Klystrons, they don't generate microwaves. That's the big difference between them, but they act more as a microwave amplifier and are suitable for these high energy elect, um, accelerators that we utilize in most clinics. Now the accelerator waveguide, it consists of that copper tube that also was mentioned before with its interior divided by these copper discs and diaphragms, which allow for you to have the varying aperture and spacing. And they're filled with, um, they're gas filled and allows free propagation of those electrons. Now it is a metal structure <clears throat> and it has these wonderful cross sections where you get to see the acceleration of these electron beams with these um, surrounding uh, magnetic waves around them. Now the head components, I mentioned this in brief because there's so much to say. All of these components help to shape the beam, whether you're talking about the primary collimator as well as the uh, flattening, um, flattening filter, which helps to make sure that the beam is actually going to be uniform. I see I've got three minutes and I'm going to work with that. So when you have a, a beam, the most important thing is that it's going to be appropriately to your tumor. You don't want to leave a cell behind. Your whole goal is to make sure that it's uniform and shaped to the, um, to the orientation that you want. And then what you'll notice is that right underneath that particular flattening filter, there also is an ion chamber. And now you're wondering, wait a minute, so you're measuring dose in the LINAC? Of course. Why? Because you need to know what it's giving to know that it's giving what you asked it to give to the patient. So there's a whole dose monitoring system that's there, which utilizes transmission ionization, ionization chambers, and they're permanently embedded in the LINAC and they're verifying on any given second that that machine is on that is delivering the dose rate and doses that you expected it to and gives a warning and shuts it down before it gets out of tolerance. So there are so many feedback systems and this is what those, de those detectors look like to make sure that that, act, that whole entire LINAC is operating the way that you expect. So we've moved quite a far way from in the very beginning, from the humble beginning to the four field box era from the 1950s to where we are today, image guided IMRT era. What I want you to understand, this is what old radiotherapy looked like. You would have a 2D film that the doctor would use to draw where you want to have open to the radiation exposure and then the hatched areas where you want to protect, meaning where for this patient where the brain was. So the whole reason why now we use IGRT as I close out and make Dr. Gay smile is to utilize image guided radiation therapy to provide in-room imaging to let you know simultaneously as you deliver treatment where the tumor is and where everything else is. And I love this brother because it tells you the truth of the story and it's a nice way to end. You obviously can't treat what you can't see. And there are a legion of us, 10,000 plus medical physicists utilizing linear accelerators to do this work on a daily basis. And I want you to know you can join us if you're interested. AAPM.org. If you want to join me, take my white lab coat off of me, let me know. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for that energetic and killer talk. And I think we have time for questions. Hello? Okay. First off, this is my second or third time I've seen you talk, and I really appreciate your talks, and I really appreciate your energy. Two, um, on the slide where you were showing, I guess, the decrease, the decrease in, like, absorbed radiation for different parts of the body, or it was like the liver. For the proton, right? For the, yeah, for the proton, mm -hmm. you, like that slide. It, 
I guess over time it showed that you decrease the amount that we take in, but yeah, it's showing curious. the different no, therapies no. that we can use. Let's see, let me go back. I get what it is. I'm just curious about specifically. I'll, it'll make more sense when it's up there. Sorry, you went through a lot of slides. It's all cool. I'm gonna find it. Uh, yeah, Bam. see, like in the liver, I guess in between 2000 and 2005, I was curious. If you look at like where the heart and the lung doses, they don't drop by nearly the same factor that the liver does, but then it goes back up in 2010 for the liver. And I was yeah. just curious if you had any insights as to why it's different there, I guess trend wise. Oh, well, it's not just trend lines. What you're seeing is the average dose for a particular patient utilized with this particular um, type of, uh, of IMPT treatment. So what you're really seeing is the result of true issues with trying to um, do a little bit of, how do I put this? We call this um, dosimetry. So there's a group of people that are called medical dosimetrists. They create the treatment plan. So you see these wonderful images here which show anatomy and then these wonderful color splashes which indicate dose being delivered to different areas. What you're seeing as a composite, these numbers here shown for the amount of dose given to the heart, lung, and liver, it's an average for that pool of patients who received a treatment utilizing that type of technique. So for the IMPT technique, that particular cohort, for whatever reason, um, with where their tumors were, that they were not able to actually reduce the amount of liver dose to being lower than what they had with passive protons from the 2005 cohort. That's all. So it's actually us not lying. There are times when you, based upon where that anatomy is in relation to where the tumor is, you can't get a, you don't get a free lunch with energy it has to go somewhere and so i'm not sure what the you know technological technologically advanced option that's as low as they could get it for that overall cohort but there are probably people who did have under 218 centigrade and others who actually had a little bit more just because of where the disease was in relation to where the beam had to enter no worries thank you so much for the kind words i really appreciate that any other questions uh, i think we can ask questions to all the speakers yes no? for everyone yeah yes doctors patterson and glassmark are all excited he said, yeah, <laughs> very. <laughs> oh, so I have a bit of, oh, my name is Chris Modi. I'm a senior in high school in Illinois. Oh. So my question was, when you're creating um, these types of beams and stuff, how are you able to make it in a way where it's able to avoid healthy cells and directly target the cancer cells without defecting the actual healthy cells? As you can see, because I'm not going to lie, just based upon being truthful to the person that just asked a question in front of you, it depends on the orientation, because you know everything next to where you enter, it's collateral damage. I hate to admit that. What we do is we intensely modulate, meaning that we shape it utilizing these weird looking, almost gold apertures, especially for proton, to shape just to the area to where we want to deliver the tumor, uh, the tumor dose to. But unfortunately, everything that's in the um, front of that tumor, it gets some level of dose. Of course, much less than what the ultimate target gets, but you cannot just drop, I wish there was a magic beam. That's what we need, not crib. We need the magic beam, which is like a unicorn and just woo, drops dose at death, but it comes in zero. I, 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 there is no such beam like that, but I hope you guys figure it out. So you modulate it as best you can, but you accept the 2.35 gray to all those things in front of that beam. And that's where the real innovation such as flash, which I didn't have any time to talk about, where if you play with the dose rate, your cells act confused and act as if they did not see any radiation at all. But that's a real scary thing to talk about that we still can't explain why, but hopefully getting to be around you guys. Yes, <laughs> I know it's going to rub off. It's going to rub off. You guys are going to help us understand why flash works because that is something that really just picked up since like 2017 and now is the biggest thing in radiotherapy for cancer treatment. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Shitali. I'm a RN and RNNP. So thank you so much for explaining. Um, really, I do see patients uh, with the, this proton therapy at Northwestern, we use it. Um, I do see really effective, and I wanna tell you that it does affect because the side effects are so low mm -hmm. that patients do go home on time. And 
I do really positive things with this. So I really appreciate what you guys have done. So thank you so much. This never happens. I want you, did you guys plant her? This never happens. I've never seen a physicist ever congratulate you for helping. And protons are positive ions. So that's the funny part that you said you're, you see positive. It is true. So there's a whole space for any of you students to really sort of actually be very practical. I mean, I'm not as theoretical as these guys. I'm not just experimental. I just use everything that they talk about for very rudimentary needs, you know, for killing things. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, yeah. it does affect because yeah. side effects are so high yeah. in these young patients because yeah. we do uh, with the children's. Uh, so I do see a great amount of, um, you know, how it affects from regular yes. radiation to proton therapy. So I really mm -hmm. want to thank you for all this. I never knew that I was going to sit here and listen yes. to you, but your energy is awesome, <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you for what you do because working with cancer patients is not an easy thing. So seriously, thank you for being an RN. You guys stand in the gap for all of us. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I think there is, there was one question over there. For Dr. K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I send the bill when I go to the hospital. Yeah, he has all his steps. Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, great talk. So all of these therapies are using protons, right? Um, no, I don't want you to think that. I just that protons are just one other avenue. We have every variety of being that you can imagine utilized for medical purposes. Okay, so um, presumably people use uh, like electron beams in order to, mm -hmm. okay. So I guess, is there, um, is there uh, any real advantage that you get from using these like you know, different particles as opposed yes. to a proton? Every particle has a different characteristic about its beam and how it deposits dose. I think that's why it's great being a physicist. Like you recognize this. You're like, oh my gosh, the reason why you don't want a little light electron because it's not going to go that deep. It's going to stop just mm -hmm. my, past your skin. It's not doing much. You're like, I got to go deep. I got to get to the liver, you know? So if you need that, you need something with weight. Where are my curvy people at? It's okay. <laughs> You're a proton. You're proton shape. And so it allows for you, because you got charged, you're positive, and you have weight. You can drop heavier dose at depth. So there is a reason why we use everything. But then photons, hey, if you just got just good enough insurance, you know, you don't have no proton insurance money. Guess what? Photons can still work, but you will have more side effects. But if they, are they effective? Yes. If you use intensity modulation, you use VMAT and so forth. And if you have skilled medical physicists and dosimetrists creating the treatment plan, we can make it work with almost any beam type. Except electrons, it has to be very superficial. But beyond that, don't worry. If you can't get proton, don't think it's the end of the world. Photons can be utilized to help too. Oh, yes, sir. Is there a specific um, dosage for each condition or each type of cancer? That's what the radiation oncologist MDs are for. They literally make $400,000 a year just to explain when you should apply which type of technique and regimen for the dose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm letting you know. I'm not lying. I want you to understand who is at the top of the food chain in rad therapy. But remember, even as a physicist, you're doing very well. Ask me privately and I'll tell you. <laughs> so, hi, oh. my name is Kyra Williams. I'm a senior at Jackson State University, graduating this fall. And I'm honestly hoping to apply to UT Health. So I saw you're like, you're like the one black woman on their, on their page. I don't mean to say that, but we, that's what we're here I for. I feel so I, sad now that you pointed that out. Yes, I am the one black woman. But yeah, and I there was will interested be in all the there research that more. you're doing, like in radiology yeah. and all that. It's like, I'm fangirling right now. But just because everybody had to say thank you. So I've been stalking for this thing. Like I Googled it and I was like, Wait, she's here. I'm like, I'm so hyped, so hyped. But I wanted to ask you, because I know you were saying that all of this is really expensive. So how do you feel like that that's going to be targeted to underrepresented communities? Like how can these people who can't afford, who don't have that good insurance, these you still get treatment. I want you to understand, if you have some type of insurance, and that includes Medicare, Medicaid, where are my Medicare people at? Most of us at least have that. And you can still get photons. So don't think, and that's why I want people to understand that there are effective photon-based treatments and even electron if it will suffice for these cases. Protons is if you can, and if, especially if you're pediatric, you almost get it guaranteed. 
So that's one thing I love. And MD Anderson is working on having a free, a free proton pediatric program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have charity based programming is what she's saying. And so all kinds of, um, especially indigent care for those people who really don't have any access, even homeless people, I will see them in the clinic. You have to meet certain qualifications. But my thing is, I don't want anyone to think that a cancer diagnosis is the end. Get checked, get your mammogram, get whatever test you need and get treatment early so that it's less of a miracle needed to treat you. Oh. Hi, um, my name is Morgan Cole. I'm a first year PhD candidate at Yale. Um, I'm working astrophysics now, but actually previously I've worked with plasma accelerators and I got to see some people be doing um, flash RT, which I did not expect to and never expected to be doing medical physics. Um, but I guess sort of the elevator pitch we give for plasma accelerators is for the compactness that can be tabletop accelerators. Um, and that is one of the angles for having it be more accessible and easy to produce for hospitals. So I guess maybe this is a question that connects things for all of you. What are the main um, barriers or next steps to making this technology more accessible, whether that be technological or, or political? What barriers do you guys see and what are the next most important things to address? I don't think it's political. I'm not aware of a political barrier. I think there are technical ones. Um, repetition rate uh, for some kind, stability, uh, reaching high enough energy in some cases, though for medical uses, I think actually we're there. Um, but there's just making it something that can move from the lab into uh, a, a, a real environment. That's the last one. Hi, Hi um, nice talk, by the way. Uh, my name is Ajuro. Um, I'm a postdoc at BNL. So I was just sort of curious. Um, so this talk seems to be centered around um, particles of beam of particles. So is it just that one little tool that is used in MD Anderson, or are there radioisotopes, for example, actinium, for example? There is a plethora of them. You can have carbon beams, all kinds of beams. And like, even if you leave MD Anderson, I, I'm not trying to push you away, but if you were to go up the road, Dallas, UT Southwest, I, some of you guys may be aware of their physics center there and so forth. They're um, definitely on the forefront of looking at carbon and other types of heavy ion beams. And we collaborate with them to some degree. And a lot of the work that we do when you're looking at that, at the exotic isotopes, as I should say, yeah, the exotic ones, like zebra isotopes, I just said that. Um, they happen to do all their work near Germany, where Glassmacher it's from right i would assume so we do use other ions it's just that when it comes to feasibility cost size scale it's not politics it's money <laughs> and so it's easier just to do that work in other places but america i don't know how many um, facilities exist which would allow for to use them for medical purposes that's why i think everything is done in japan and, and europe Please, please. <laughs> so, so carbon, the Bragg peak, gives you more energy over a shorter distance, so it's better. Invented actually at the Bevelac in um, Berkeley, then oh. it went to, nobody knows that. I didn't and then the US gave it away. And it's um, then brought to medical in Germany, in Heidelberg, mm -hmm. and now the Japanese have it. Um, a clinic in Minnesota was gonna build a synchrotron for carbon therapy. I don't know, I forgot the name. And then, in Rochester, what is oh. it? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about oh, okay, gotcha. it's some competitor. It's a big so any, competitor. Big competitor, anyways. But they did the reimbursement rate right now is not good enough. Yeah. So it's too expensive. And the right. trouble with the carbon is you need to go to above 400 mm -hmm. MeV, better 500 to get into the tissue. And so you need a bigger synchrotron. Well, the synchrotron, which happens to be big and expensive, oh, yeah. it's money. Proton insurance, carbon insurance is the real deal. Yes, <laughs> it's a really big problem. So it's not politics, wish it were. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you all for the thank questions you. and let's thank the speakers again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so it's much. Nice to meet you, nice you too. Yes. And with this, we close this section. Do you want to have anything else? So the session is closed and thank you. You, you guys can go to the next, uh, uh, the next event. But all the PING students and parents stick around. We're going to go somewhere to take a picture.
before you guys disappear.